It is considered a holy site in Judaism and Christianity, with thousands making the annual pilgrimage to the River Jordan. The Jordan River has been a sacred and mysterious site for millennia, attracting countless seekers and adventurers to its shores in search of divine and historical revelations. However, in recent months, this once mighty stream of water has been gradually shrinking. As it does, it has exposed secrets that no one expected. And, well, it gets even crazier as now something incredibly massive has just surfaced under the Jordan River. What is going on? Join us as we explore the shocking discovery that's been revealed in the dried up Jordan River and how it might alter everything we've ever learned about the region. The Jordan River is a sacred site that holds a deep meaning for millions of people. It is a witness to the ancient history and the modern innovation of the region. It is a source of life and beauty, but also of conflict and controversy. It is also a place where a shocking discovery has been made, a discovery that challenges our understanding of the past and the future. But before we delve deeper into this recent discovery, it's important to understand the context and the significance of the Jordan River. The Jordan River flows from north to south through the Great Rift Valley, from the slopes of Mount Hermon to the Dead Sea, the lowest point on Earth. Along its course, it passes by Petra, a stunning city carved into the red sandstone cliffs of Jordan over 2,000 years ago by the Nabataeans. Petra is a marvel of engineering and art, a testament to the skill and the vision of its builders. The entrance to Petra is through the Sik, a narrow canyon that leads to the treasury, the most famous and impressive building in Petra. The treasury is a massive and intricately carved structure that was once thought to contain hidden treasure. But the treasury is only the beginning. Petra is full of other wonders, such as temples, tombs, theatres, and markets that reflect its rich and diverse history as a hub of trade and culture. Beyond Petra, the Jordan River continues its journey, crossing the borders of Jordan, Israel, the Palestinian West Bank, and Syria. The river is not only a natural wonder, but also a religious one. For Christians, the Jordan River is the place where Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, a momentous event that marked the beginning of his ministry. The river is also mentioned in both the Old and New Testaments as the site of many important events and stories, such as the crossing of the Israelites into the Promised Land, the healing of Naaman the leper, and the preaching of John the Baptist. The river has been a destination for pilgrims and believers for centuries who come to be baptized or to witness the holy waters. But sadly, the Jordan River is not what it used to be. The river is in a state of decline losing its flow and its glory. The river is suffering from the effects of climate change, geopolitical tensions, and human activities such as pollution and water diversion for agricultural and domestic use. According to Yana Abu Taleb, Jordanian director of EcoPeace Middle East, the river's water levels have dropped significantly, with the United States Geological Survey, USGS, reporting that the Jordan River now only brings 100 million cubic meters per year into the Dead Sea, compared to 1.3 billion cubic meters in the past. The river's flow has also been further impacted by the competing demands of Israel, Syria, and Jordan for access to its water supply. Nations fighting over water access means that it's difficult for Jordan to be revitalized, as none of the affected parties want to give up any of their water, but as the river dries up, it reveals something that has been hidden for a long time, something that is shocking and mysterious, something that we will explore in the later part of this video. One of the biggest discoveries of the Jordan River area was the Dead Sea Scrolls. These ancient manuscripts, discovered between 1947 and 1956 in 11 caves near Qumran on the northwestern shores of the Dead Sea, are approximately 2,000 years old, dating from the 3rd century BCE to the 1st century CE2. But apart from being old, what makes them so special? The Dead Sea Scrolls are a remarkable collection of ancient manuscripts that reveal the earliest traces of the biblical text in the world. They were mostly written in Hebrew, the sacred language of the Jewish people, 
but some were also composed in Aramaic or Greek, the languages of the surrounding cultures. The scribes who wrote them used homemade parchment made from animal skins as their writing material, except for a few scrolls that were written on papyrus, a plant-based paper. The harsh conditions of the desert preserved these scrolls for thousands of years, but only as fragments, scattered and torn by time and human hands. Yet, thanks to the painstaking efforts of scholars, these fragments have been pieced together to form about 950 different manuscripts of varying sizes and contents. These manuscripts can be classified into three main categories, Biblical, Apocryphal and Sectarian. The Biblical manuscripts include some 200 copies of books from the Hebrew Bible, also known as the Old Testament, covering every book except Esther. These copies show how the biblical text was transmitted and interpreted by different Jewish communities over time. The apocryphal manuscripts contain works that were not included in the official canon of the Hebrew Bible, but were still considered sacred or valuable by some Jews. Some of these works were already known from translations in other languages, such as the Book of Enoch or the Book of Jubilees, but others were completely new discoveries, such as the Genesis Apocryphon or the Testament of Levi. The sectarian manuscripts reflect the beliefs and practices of a specific Jewish sect that lived at Qumran, near the Dead Sea, where most of the scrolls were found. This sect is usually identified as the Essenes, one of the three main Jewish groups in the Second Temple period, along with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The sectarian manuscripts cover a wide range of literary genres such as biblical commentary, religious lore, liturgy and apocalyptic visions. They reveal the distinctive worldview and lifestyle of the Qumran sect, which was characterized by strict observance of the Torah, communal organization, messianic expectations and opposition to the ruling authorities. However, not all of the scrolls belong to the Qumran sect, as some of them were written or copied elsewhere and brought to the site for safekeeping or study. The discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls was a watershed moment in the history of biblical and Jewish studies, for it unveiled a treasure trove of ancient literature that had been hidden for centuries. To say that the scrolls are special would be a gross understatement, and so would be the story of how they were found. The first seven scrolls were discovered by sheer luck, it happened in 1947 when a group of Bedouin shepherds, who are native nomads of the Negev Desert in southern Israel, stumbled upon a cave near Qumran on the northwest shore of the Dead Sea. Inside the cave, they found several clay jars that contained leather scrolls wrapped in linen. They did not realize the significance of their find and sold some of the scrolls to a local dealer. Three of the scrolls were quickly acquired by E. L. Sukunik, an archaeologist from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, who recognized their importance and published their contents. The other four scrolls were bought by Mar Athanasius Samuel, the Metropolitan of the Syrian Orthodox Church in East Jerusalem, who smuggled them to the United States in 1948, hoping to sell them for a high price. It took six years before Sukunik's son, Yigael Yadin, also an archaeologist, was able to purchase them and bring them back to Israel. In the following years, from 1949 to 1956, more scrolls were discovered, both by Bedouins and by a joint archaeological expedition of the École Biblique et Archéologique Française and the Rockefeller Museum, led by Professor Father Roland de Vaux. They explored 11 caves near Qumran and found thousands of scroll fragments, as well as other artifacts, such as pottery, coins and textiles. They also excavated the ruins of Qumran, which revealed the remains of a settlement that housed the sect that produced or collected the scrolls. Since then, no more scrolls have been found, despite occasional searches and surveys in the area. But the story of the scrolls does not end there, for they continue to inspire new discoveries and questions. Recently, archaeologists have uncovered near Jericho what may be the first ever evidence of the biblical story of Exodus. The biblical story of Exodus is one of the most captivating and influential narratives in human history. It tells the epic saga of how the Israelites, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, 
escaped from the oppressive rule of the Pharaoh in Egypt and received the Ten Commandments from God at Mount Sinai. The story spans four books of the Hebrew Bible, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. It begins with the Israelites groaning under the harsh slavery imposed by the Egyptian king who feared their growing numbers and power. God heard their cry and raised up Moses, a Hebrew who was adopted by the Pharaoh's daughter to be their leader and deliverer. Through Moses, God unleashed ten terrible plagues on Egypt such as blood, frogs, locusts and darkness until the Pharaoh reluctantly agreed to let the Israelites go. Moses then led them across the Red Sea, which God miraculously parted to create a dry path for them and drowned the pursuing Egyptian army. Once they reached the Sinai Peninsula, the Israelites camped at the foot of Mount Sinai, where Moses ascended to meet God and received the Ten Commandments, the core of the covenant between God and his people. The Israelites then set out for the promised land of Canaan, but along the way they faced many challenges and temptations, such as hunger, thirst, rebellion, idolatry and war. They also encountered God's presence and guidance, such as the pillar of cloud and fire, the manna and quail, the water from the rock and the tabernacle. When they arrived at the southern border of Canaan, they sent twelve spies to scout the land but ten of them brought back a discouraging report, saying that the land was full of giants and fortified cities. The Israelites were afraid and refused to enter the land, despite the encouragement of Joshua and Caleb, the two faithful spies. As a result, God punished them by making them wander in the wilderness for 38 years, until the entire generation that had left Egypt died, except for Joshua and Caleb. After this long period of wandering, the Israelites reached the eastern border of Canaan, where Moses gave them his final speeches, reminding them of God's laws and blessings and urging them to be faithful and obedient. Moses then climbed Mount Nebo, where God showed him the promised land from afar and then died and was buried by God in an unknown location. The leadership of the Israelites then passed to Joshua, who led them across the River Jordan and into the promised land. The first city they conquered was Jericho, whose walls fell down after the Israelites marched around them for seven days, following God's instructions. The story of Exodus is a foundational story for the Jewish and Christian faiths, but it is also a controversial story for historians and archaeologists who have not found any conclusive evidence to support its historical accuracy. However, some experts are currently investigating an ancient site near the River Jordan that could potentially provide some clues or proof of the Israelite presence in the region. The site is called Kerbit el Mastara, and it is located about five miles north of Jericho. It has been dated to the early Iron Age, which corresponds to the traditional timeline of the Israelite arrival in Canaan around the 13th or 12th century BCE. So far, so good. But what makes this site interesting is that it does not look like a typical settlement of that period, but rather like a temporary encampment of a nomadic people. The site consists of several low stone walls that form circular or oval structures, which are believed to be animal pens rather than human dwellings. The pottery shards found on the site are also consistent with the early Iron Age, and they are mostly scattered outside of the stone walls rather than inside. This suggests that the people who lived there did not use the structures as houses, but as corrals for their livestock, and that they lived in tents around them. This is in line with the nomadic lifestyle of the Bedouins, the indigenous people of the Negev Desert, who still inhabit the region today. Dr. David Ben, an archaeologist from Ariel University, and his American colleague Ralph Hawkins from Averett University, have a theory about this site. They think that it could be related to the Israelites, who were also a nomadic people before they settled in Canaan. They argue that this site could be one of the places where the Israelites camped during their journey from the wilderness to the Promised Land, and that the stone structures were used to protect their animals from predators and thieves. They also claim that the lack of fines, or small particles of soil, inside the structures made it impossible to date them by conventional methods such as carbon-14 or thermoluminescence, 
and that this explains why the site has been overlooked by previous researchers. This theory, if true, would change everything we thought we knew about this area. It would mean that we have found the first ever evidence of the biblical story of Exodus and that we can trace the footsteps of the Israelites as they entered the land of Canaan. Meanwhile, archaeologists are working hard to verify whether this site, located near Jericho, was indeed an Israelite encampment or whether it belonged to another group of people. To do so, they have to use various scientific methods to date the site and to identify its cultural features. One of the methods they are using is called optically stimulated luminescence, OSL, which measures the amounts of electrons that have accumulated in the soil over time. These electrons are trapped by natural radiation in the environment and they are only released when they are exposed to light. By taking soil samples from beneath the stone walls that form the structures at the site, the archaeologists can determine when the walls were built and thus how old the site is. The more electrons there are in the soil, the older the site is. Another method they are using is the phosphorus analysis, which detects the presence of phosphorus in the soil. Phosphorus is an element that is found in organic matter, such as animal dung, and it can indicate the level of human or animal activity at the site. By taking soil samples from between the stone walls, the archaeologist can test whether the structures were used as animal pens, as they suspect, or for some other purpose. The higher the phosphorus level, the more likely the structures were used for animals. These two methods alone can provide valuable information about the age and function of the site, but they are not enough to confirm its identity. The archaeologists also need to look for cultural clues that can link the site to the Israelites or to another group of people. This is not an easy task, as the material culture of different groups in the region may be very similar or not very distinctive. Dr. Ben, the co-director of the Kerbet El Mastara excavation project, said that finding such clues is very difficult and that they have to rely on the facts and the data they have. One of the clues they are looking for is the pottery style, which can reflect the origin and the preference of the people who used it. Another clue is the religious practice, which can reveal the beliefs and the values of the people who lived there. To find more clues, the archaeologists are also planning to excavate another site nearby called Uja El Foka, which may be related to the Israelite settlement of the region. They hope to find more evidence that can support or challenge their theory that Kerbet El Mastara was an Israelite encampment. This discovery is very intriguing, but it is still in progress. It may take years before the archaeologists can reach a definitive conclusion about the site and its connection to the story of Exodus. But even if they do, they will not be the first humans to explore this area. Long before the Israelites, or any other group of people, arrived in the region, there were other human creatures who lived and hunted along the banks of the Jordan River. Evidence suggests that about 60,000 years ago, this area was teeming with life. Human creatures, whose exact identity and origin are still unknown, hunted large animals, including an extinct species of wild cattle called aurochs in this area. Excavations at the outlet of the Nahal Mahanaim stream, which flows into the Jordan River, revealed bone remains that can attest to this. But this was not just a regular hunting ground. It was a place where human creatures ambushed, killed and butchered their prey. According to a paper published in the Journal of Archaeological Science, the Nahal Mahanaim site was a specialized hunting site where human creatures used the natural features of the landscape, such as the stream and the vegetation, to trap and kill the animals. But who exactly were they? Were they Neanderthals or modern humans or perhaps hybrids or even an unknown species who left no trace of their DNA or culture? The mystery of their identity remains unsolved, but one thing is clear. They were skilled hunters who exploited the resources of the area. The sheer number of aurochs bones at the site indicates that hunting these large animals was a frequent and successful activity. What is remarkable is how the hunters managed to do it with a limited number of tools. Normally, human creatures of this time period would have a variety of tools including scrapers for preparing animal hides, which were used for clothing and shelter. But at Nahal Mahanaim, 
The tools were mainly pointed elements, such as spear tips and cutting tools, which were used for killing and butchering the animals. The evidence suggests that the site was used for short periods of time, perhaps only a week at a time, and that it was task-specific. The hunters came to the site to butcher and process the carcasses of the animals they hunted and then moved on to another location. But how did they hunt down such massive creatures with only simple tools in their hands? This was the question that puzzled the archaeologists who examined the site of Nahal Mahanaim, where human creatures killed and butchered aurochs, an extinct species of wild cattle, about 60,000 years ago. The tools they found at the site were mainly pointed elements, such as spear tips and cutting tools, which were used for stabbing and slicing the animals. But surprisingly, only a few of these tools had signs of impact fractures, which meant that the hunters did not throw their spears from afar, but rather approached their prey closely, exposing themselves to danger and death. This discovery challenged the conventional wisdom about the ancient hunting techniques. Humans were not just scavengers or opportunists who waited for the right moment to strike. They were predators who faced their fears and hunted their prey with courage and skill. They were not intimidated by the size or the strength of the animals they hunted, even though they were much larger and fiercer than they were. But this was not the oldest evidence of human activity in the area. There was something even older and more surprising. Fish teeth were recently found in the dried up parts of the Jordan River. They belonged to huge fish that were caught and cooked by prehistoric humans near the river in what is now northern Israel some 780,000 years ago. The researchers who studied the fish teeth concluded that the fish were cooked at a specific temperature using a slow cooking method which dissolved the rest of the skeleton before they were eaten. This showed that the humans knew exactly what they were doing and that they had a sophisticated knowledge of cooking. The study revealed how important fish was for the early hominins who migrated from Africa to the Levant and beyond. Fish provided them with a rich source of protein and omega-3 fatty acids, which were essential for their brain development and health. Fish also gave them a stable and reliable food supply, which enhanced their economic and social well-being. The study also confirmed that the ancient Hula Lake, which was connected to the Jordan River, had fish species that later became extinct. All of these revelations would leave you wondering how much more there is to discover and how much more there is to learn. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, click now on the next video that pops up on your screen. You'll be stunned.